Well, this morning I want to continue with our, our series, which is called The Spiritual Man. And uh, we've been on the subject now for a couple of weeks. And uh, we're talking about hindrances to regeneration. And I've been saying to us uh, over a period of time now that, that there are several hindrances uh, that, that will hinder us and hinder our movements in Christ Jesus. And so, like I've been saying consistently, and I know it's, it's repetition, but these are teaching sessions. These are doctrinal sessions. These are e uh, equipping sessions. And whenever bread, which is Christ, is broken in our midst. And remember, bread is our diet. Bread is what sustains us. Bread is what feeds us. And this bread is no ordinary bread. This is, this is Christ himself. Jesus said very clearly, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that, that came from heaven. And so, you know, these are, these are, are very important uh, teachings. And uh, when Adam disobeyed the word of the Lord, we know that his natural life opened. And he started to, to be governed by that eye. He started to be ruled by that eye. And we as the sons of God are not called to be ruled and governed by our natural eye. And we spoke much about uh, naturalization over the last two weeks. But I want to continue from there this week. And talk about, uh, talk about a very important subject. And uh, we know that uh, hindrances to regeneration is a thing that provides a resistance, a delay, or an obstruction. And uh, within the 21st century, we as the sons of God must begin to live a life that reflects Him, that will reflect His ways, that will reflect His mind, and that will reflect His heart, that will align ourselves to His purposes to align ourselves to His will, to abandon uh, ourselves, to abandon our own will. And remember that Christ set the pattern. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ was very clear, very, very clear that it's not about my will, but His will. And remember, His will is not easy. It's not easy. It's a very difficult road. And the Bible calls it the narrow road. And we've been called to follow the narrow road and not the broad road because the broad road leads us to destruction. And so it's about living a life in the spirit. And this is what the series is eventually going to teach us. But for now, I'm just dealing with the hindrances to regeneration. And the life in the spirit is a life of a bond servant. A bond servant is one who will voluntarily surrender one's life which includes his rights, his privileges, his desires, his goals, etc. for the benefit of another. And the life of Christ on the earth displayed this for us. He displayed it in the love that he had for us by going to the cross, by, by, by dying for us and, and giving us a new life and experiencing the newness of life. And therefore, we have to, to shift away from walking in darkness and walking in disobedience, walking in unfaithfulness or ignorance or sin, because these things obliterate your spiritual sight. And so I'm hoping through the set of these teachings that our spiritual lives will really align itself. Uh, to the purposes of God. And even as I try to communicate, sometimes things that you feel in the spirit is very difficult to communicate with words because God does not speak that way. God is spirit. And these things have to be understood uh, by our spirit. And uh, these hindrances are, are, are very dangerous hindrances. And so sometimes our reliance is on, on worldliness. It, it on, we become self-reliant, uh, carnal, and we function from an unspiritual nature. And, and this is not where God wants us to live from. This is not where God wants us to live from. And so uh, I pray uh, daily that, that we will allow, that we will permit and we will submit to the formation of the spiritual man. And this morning I want to deal with the next hindrance which is called historical. Historical. Now, in John chapter 4, which is our key text, and I'd like for you to please turn with me to John chapter 4. 
verse 11, the Bible says, And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where then can you get that living water? Now remember, we've dealt extensively of how she was naturalizing what God was saying spiritually. And a natural man cannot understand spiritual things. But when you go to verse 12, the Bible says, Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well? And he drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock. So this is the response of this woman. And we notice that the woman at the well does not have... Uh, you know, she's, she's, she's not completely blinded with regards to God. Uh, we notice that she has some knowledge with regards to God. A knowledge is rooted into the practices of religion. And uh, we notice that, that these things are passed down to her. It's passed down to, it's not as if she's completely ignorant or she does not know anything. But, but we notice that, that she, she has, a, has an historical perspective with regards to God. And so when Jesus is declaring uh, uh, something spiritual to her, she, because of naturalization and because of being, uh, you know, indoctrinated with regards to religious practices she draws from that she draws from that and you notice that consistently she will go to this well because this well was there to feed her it was there to sustain her it was there to sustain her home it was there to sustain a livelihood and she would consistently go and draw from these places but these things have become a tradition in her life tradition and so we're not talking to someone with an understanding of God and so you we can be involved in religious practices and religious beliefs and religious traditions but not really know God not really know God and I'll show you a little later on from scripture but however, we notice that, that, you know, with regards to religious, traditional and historical understanding, it is an hindrance to receiving the things of God. There's a resistance with regards to receiving the things of God. And, and you notice that there is no personal conviction. No personal conviction. Now, I'll tell you why I'm making these statements, because see, traditions maybe you get good traditions good traditions but they not may not necessarily be right you can be sincere and all fast to traditions but it does not mean uh, that that it is the ways of god or the things of god and so historical view can be very dangerous and it can keep you in bondage. An historical view can blind you from the purposes of the Lord. And it can hinder the workings of the Holy Spirit. And we can become comfortable with, religious, with a religious life. And not transition into a life in the Spirit. You can become comfortable doing the same thing week in, week out, day in day out. A life in the spirit is the life of a son of God and it is in our sonship and through our sonship that we live a life in the spirit and this means we do not neglect our walk with the Lord and so there's two things religious versus relationship and so many people cannot tell the difference between the two and this becomes a dangerous playground because we have to discern what is religious and what is relationship. And so we have to live by relationship with the Lord. We have to consistently walk with the Lord. And, and this becomes important, important because if we want to fulfill the purposes of God, if we want to come up higher, if we want to access the voice of God, if we want to become the voice to the nations, 
the voice of God to the nations, if we want to do mighty exploits for God, it is absolutely imperative that we, we can discern between that which is religious and that which is through relationship uh, with the Holy Spirit, with, with the Spirit of God. And so these things become important. Now, uh, very quickly in Mark chapter 7, Verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you old the tradition of men. By laying aside the commandment, in other words, we can take the word of God and we can put it one side. And we can hold on to the traditions of men. The washing of pitchers and the cups that others may, other such things, uh, you do. He said to them, all do well, sorry, all do well to reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Now, can you see, Jesus is talking about something very important, very important. Now, he, he, he mentions the same thing again in Matthew chapter 15, where it says, he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God, and that is the word of God, of no effect by your tradition. And so traditions neutralizes the power of God's word. Like, like Jesus said in the book of Mark, that you take the word of God and you leave it one side. And you hold fast now to your traditions and the traditions that Christ was talking about was re religious practices religious practices right and and these things in the it is an hindrance to regeneration because uh, God has called is calling us out of those things out of those things Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 the Bible says beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ so can you see there, there is a a difference between the traditions of men and the traditions of Christ. And so if we plant ourselves, if we root ourselves into the traditions of men, we will not come to the place that God is pulling us out. Uh, off into and, and he wants to baptize us immerse us into himself and so this transition it it it, it, it must be made it, 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 it has to be made and so over a period of time our history that which we grew up with that that which we have learned over a period of time sometimes can become a stumbling block uh, to the things of God and like Peter who said Lord these things shall never happen to you shall never happen to you and Jesus said to him get behind me Satan and the Lord rebuked him and the Lord rebuked him because he said to Peter uh, you are m not mindful of the things of God but of men and so Peter was all obviously holding fast to, to, to certain traditional beliefs, beliefs. And I'll show you later on through scripture uh, in terms of what I'm trying to say. And so, you know, sometimes if I take my own life, for example, I grew up in church and I knew nothing else but church life. So I was not... Uh, a, a convert or, or anything of that sort. I grew up in church. I put my my, my white uh, dress to be baptized to be uh, what's that word uh, to be dedicated unto the Lord uh, at the age of of uh, one plus. I was already in Sunday school. 
and basically basically that was my life that was my life but there were certain traditions there were certain practices that was taught to me and I grew up in, in those practices and that's all I knew that's all I believed until one day someone opened my eyes to certain things opened my eyes to certain things uh, you know I remember uh, you know for us growing up you know certain uh, you know uh, seasonal things that that we would face would it was stuff that we'd experience all the time all the time we grew up with this it became part of our lives you know and so I remember when Chantal and I first got married it was our first marriage uh, not yeah sorry it is our first marriage uh, it still is the first marriage for those of you that are uh, maybe confused and uh, it was our home our own home and we were so excited and I remember it was coming to Christmas and uh, we went to the shop we walked we bought the biggest tree we could find and uh, let me tell you we invested a lot of money in in, uh, in decorations and uh, we wanted to have the best of whatever and it was our home and we wanted to invite people into our home etc and so we grew up with that and when we entered into our marriage what we we grew up with and what we were taught and what we celebrated is what we brought into it what we brought into it and so someone taught me someone opened my eyes with regards to paganism and my spirit latched onto it latched onto it but at first at first when i heard it my resistance was my whole life this is what i did my whole life this is what i celebrated my whole life this is how i grew up but when my spirit latched on to what i was listening what i was listening because i have to be honest with you there was a, a certain level of resistance and the question is why now what kind of teaching is this why because it goes against what i've been taught and brought up with for the rest of my life i didn't just automatically in the first five minutes of what was being said to me in the first five minutes i'm saying what are you talking about and at the back of my mind i'm saying do you know the amount of money i just invested and believe you me we, we did this three or four days before this truth was exposed to us and uh, and when the when the, the scripture was read from jeremiah chapter 10 verses 1 onwards it says hear the word of the lord which speaks to you O house of israel thus says the lord do not learn the way of gentiles do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven for gentiles are dismayed at them for the customs of the people are futile for one cuts a tree from the forest with the work of the hands of a workman with an axe they decorate it with silver and gold they fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple they are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak they must be carried they cannot uh, go by themselves do not be afraid of them for they can do no evil and so you know when when i when the word of god came to me my my god was dealing with certain things on the inside of me and remember this is my conviction if it's not your conviction then uh, you know that is between you and the lord but i am saying my conviction when when this was read you know there are other things that i grew up with which the lord had to extract from my my life because we had to go and search out the scriptures we had to go and search out the scriptures you know if god really wanted us to to celebrate his birth in that manner he'd have told us he'd have told us he said hey my friend if you miss 25th of december i, I will finish you I, I will do this to you this is how i want you to celebrate me. but christ must be celebrated every day remember we practice the table of the lord every day similarly similarly we, we must celebrate christ in our lives on a daily basis 
Most people globally only go to church on Christmas Day. But for us, the Christ has become uh, part of our lives. Growing up in church, there are practices, superstitious practices that pass, pass down to me. For example, the applying of the blood of Jesus. We grew up in environments where we were taught to apply the blood of Jesus over everything. We would eventually apply it over the sweets that we were about to eat because we were taught that on everything. Before we drive, we'll apply it from the bumper to bumper of our car. We never searched out the scriptures. It, it was what was passed down. It was taught to us. Some people were, were, were taught to apply the blood of Jesus on their honeymoon bed. Uh, we were taught to apply, or rather to pray over a glass of water and sprinkle this water everywhere. Uh, and so we should not, uh, and so these became practices that, that we grew up with until the Lord opened our eyes and realized that the blood of Jesus is so powerful, so powerful, and it is there for the remission of sins. Not for us to apply it. And I've, I've taught on the subject many times. And we have notes. If you want me to make it available to you, I can do that. But we should not formulate doctrines from the activity of demons or personal experiences alone. Demons are liars. And they will do anything to reinforce unbiblical practices. We were taught to speak to demons. And ask them questions like, who sent you? Where did you come from? Where did you come from? But Jesus said that the devil is a liar. And that there is no truth in the devil. I have witnessed thousands of cases. And 90% of the time when you talk to a demon and you ask the demon, who are you? Where you came from? The demon has got two default settings. One is it's the mother-in-law and two is it is the sister-in-law. 10% comes from, from, from other places. Right? And so the person standing and listening is enjoying the stories. I used to love listening to the stories and, and have a good laugh about it. Have a good laugh about it. I remember growing up being, you know, slightly mischief. Uh, one day I was diagnosed with witchcraft. Witchcraft. I remember it was all night prayer. And the pastor was praying. He's saying, no, this fellow has got witchcraft. And so my parents were, were excited with their diagnosis because it, it couldn't be from their genes possibly. And so... They, 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 the pastor gave us a solution. The solution was that I must drink castor oil. Castor oil to remove the witchcraft that was in my body. And so Saturday morning, I remember I had to drink the castor oil to get rid of the demon, which was called witchcraft. And so can you imagine now, you've got to keep on looking behind to see now, did, did the demon come out of my system or not? And we may find it hilarious, but that's what we grew up with. That's what we grew up with. It, it was things that was taught to us. And, and that day I realized that sense is not common to all. Because how can you use castor oil to, uh, to, 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 to get rid of, to get rid of, a demon, a spirit. But that's what we grew up with. These religious traditions that were passed down, it seemed so good and so right. But some of it was absolutely wrong. And, and we thank God for that, that our eyes were opened and that the cloud that clouded us, the Lord removed it. The Lord removed it. Now imagine... If you come to me and I tell you, you have a problem, it's witchcraft, go and take castor oil and, and, and everything is, will be okay. Now, isn't that foolishness? 
but it was in the church and it was in the church for a long long time people that will have problems at home they will say take sheep dip and put it all over your house all over your house i know that that andrew now and then would apply sheep dip in his own outside his house rather but the, the the reality is how can sheep dip deal with demonic influences But that's what was taught to us. And we held fast to that. We held on to that. We, we took it into our homes. We took it into our marriages. And, and someone had to teach us. Someone had to exegete the scriptures. And by the spirit of the Lord, our eyes had to be opened. But these are just a few things. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 11 verse 28, Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden. What was Jesus talking about? He was talking to an order, a religious order that held fast with religious practices. They were laboring and they felt like a heavy weight on them. They felt like a burden. that They could not carry this weight anymore. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees would place that on them. They would place this labor and burden on them. But Jesus is saying, come to me, come to me and I will give you rest. And truth brings us into rest. Therefore, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And so family, we have to remove certain yokes and begin to yoke ourselves to the Lord. Remember, Jesus is using uh, a, an agricultural term to explain a very important spiritual principle. And if you take uh, oxen that were yoked to one another, they had to, to walk side by side and God is calling us to that place. Walking side by side with the Lord. And why do we walk side by side? Why do we yoke ourselves to the Lord? So that we can learn from Him learn from it and this is an important process in our lives and the bible says for i am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls the things that we chase in life is to satisfy the soul what we labor for is to bring satisfaction to the soul but christ is saying that i will give you rest but you have to learn from me and sometimes we are because of our historical backgrounds and traditions that have been passed down to us, we, we refuse to allow the Lord to teach us. We hold fast to traditions and we neglect the word of God. We neglect the word of God. That's why Matthew 4, 4 is so clear. It says, uh, he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And of course, Jesus is, is, is quoting uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Amen. We are called to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth. So when we talk about the formation of a spiritual man, and you look at the life of Abraham in Genesis 12, God says to him, now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. Why did God have to deal with that first? Because there are certain cultural practices, certain traditions that Abraham would have held fast to. But God had to pull him out of that environment. Pull him out of that structure. Pull him out of that wineskin. And God said to him, uh, and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you process, process a great nation. I will bless you, bless you. That's God's purpose. It's his intent. I will make your name great that you shall be a blessing. And so God had to pull Abraham out of a stronghold out of a stronghold and i want you to know when you talk about an historical cultural traditional stronghold this is a dangerous stronghold 
God has to pull us out, has to pull us out to deliver us. And when you go to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8, the Bible says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Sometimes the journey is not clear. Uncharted territories. But, but God is asking us to exit certain mentalities, to exit certain strongholds, to go to a place where He can form us and He can shape us and He can develop us and He can build us. Build us by faith. He dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign, in, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. The the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, can you see by faith he was able to do that? By faith he was able to do that. And and if if we want to see the formation of the spiritual man in our lives, family, we have to exit certain strongholds certain traditions, certain cultures and be clothed with Christ, be baptized and immersed into Him, into Him. And, and that's when our journey starts, that's when our journey begins. Uh, when you go to Acts chapter, chapter 9, in fact before we go to Acts 9, let me read this scripture for us quickly. In Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1 verse 11, uh, Paul is saying, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And remember, without revelation, nothing can be built. It is only on, 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 uh, it, it's only with regards to revelation that comes from Christ. Can we build our lives? Can we establish our lives? And verse 13 he says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So this is where Paul comes from. This is where Paul comes from. He, he, he was, he excelled, excelled. He, he was better than, better than the others that, that, that he studied with. He was zealous, he was passionate for the traditions of his fathers. Why? Because that's what he grew up with. That's what he excelled in and that's what he desired. But look at verse 15, it says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me through His grace, called me through His grace. And this separation is very important. This separation is very important. And, and we have to embrace the separation. We have to embrace the separation, because separation has an intended purpose. And the intended purpose is very clear in verse 16. It says, to reveal His Son in me. To reveal His Son. Now family, this is why we are separated unto the Lord. This is why we are consecrated. This is why we have been regenerated. To reveal His Son. That's Christ. That is the anointed one in us, in us, that I might preach him among Gentiles. And I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. <clears throat> so this is Paul talking about how God saved him, God separated him from the traditions of his fathers. So that the Son, the Son could be revealed in Him. And how many of you 
one, the Son, Christ, the Anointed One, to re be revealed in us, in us, that we may become witnesses. <coughs> Excuse me, we may become witnesses. Now, in order for us to come to the position that Paul came into, we need an encounter with God. In order for us to come to this place, we need an experience with God. And these experiences, we should not fight. We should not fight. We should not allow it to, to, to deter us or become a stumbling block to us. Because when we go to Acts chapter 9, the Bible says, And as he journeyed and came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, he fell on the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Now, now I want you to listen to this part very, very carefully. Paul realized very quickly that this is the Lord. This is the Lord. Let me tell you why I say that. In verse 5, he says, You, who are you? That, that word, uh, you, is in capital letter. Lord. So, his traditions taught him, Paul, about the Messiah that will come. He taught him about the laws. He taught him Judaism somewhat, somewhat teaches us certain practices and, 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 and religious beliefs, etc. Right? And so there's Paul on this journey, and all of a sudden he has this this, this light shines out and, and the and he hears his voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But look at his response. His response is very clear. Who are you, Lord? That word Lord is in capital letter. In other words, he knew that this was not ordinary. He knew that this could be no one else but the Lord. And so do you know that, that traditions and certain cultures that have been passed on teaches us about the Lord? But it does not mean that we know the Lord. That's the difference. That's the difference. You can hear about the Lord, but not know the Lord. And the Lord responds, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gods. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And I want you to know that to any authentic salvation, this is the question. What must I do? In Acts chapter 2, the early formation of the early church, when Peter preached and 3,000 people came to the Lord, the first question they asked him is, what must we do? The Philippine jailer in Acts chapter 16, the question is, what must I do? What must I do? Now, now, we have to come to that place. All of us. Why would God reveal himself to us? Surely it, is, it has an intended purpose for our lives. And so, the Lord said to him now, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Then the men journeyed with him, etc. I'm just going to skip because of time. Um, Let's, let's go to verse 13. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name, to bear my name uh, before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I have, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now this is the conversion of Paul. 
But Paul grew up with a different culture. He held fast to a different set of traditions. But yeah, Christ is pulling him out from that. Pulling him out from that. Uh, verse 16 is a very strange verse because it says, For I must, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. How is that for salvation? Uh, most people that come to the Lord, come to the Lord because of people that said, you will be blessed and you will enter into this and you will enter into that. And people come because of what they can get. But, but this is a formation of a chosen vessel, vessel that must bear the name of the Lord. And so we know that, that Ananias went to him and we pick up now in, in verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once. He arose and was baptized. So, you know, when we have this encounter, when, when God makes us new, the scales from our eyes has to drop. If we are really going to embrace what God has in store for us. Our historical perspective sometimes has to, the scales has to be removed. The scales of tradition has to be removed. The, the scales of certain cultures have to be removed so that we, we embrace, we, we, we clothe ourselves with Christ. Verse 18, so when he had received food, he was strengthened. And, and, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at, at Damascus. Verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ. He preached the, 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 the Son of God that was in him. The Anointed One. He preached the Christ in the synagogues. That he is the Son of God. That was his message. And that was the message of, of Paul. That he is the son of God. That, that, that the name that he had to bear. Was the name that Christ is the son of God. And I want you to know that is our gospel. And that is our message. That is our message. The spiritual man is the son of God. We are the sons of God. And all creation is groaning. For the manifestation not for the disappearance, not for the flying away, for the manifestation and the revealing of the sons of God. So family, we have been sometimes indoctrinated in a certain way. But we've got to go back to the scriptures. We've got to go back to the word of God. If not, if not, we will sit on the fence. If not, we will play it safe. And, and, and God is, is pulling us out. I mean, you know, let, let me conclude with this. I won't read all the scriptures, right? I'll just paraphrase it for you, but you can go and read it. I'll give you the scriptures. I'll give you the scriptures. But, you know, there, there was a, a person by the name of Peter who had a genuine encounter with God and, and he was doing, you know, there, there were certain exciting things taking place in his life. But in, in Acts chapter 10, he has a vision. He has a vision. And in this vision, he was, he was very hungry. And he, the Bible says that, that uh, he, he went into a trance. And he started to see an open heaven. He saw an object like a great sheet. Uh, and he saw now all kinds of four-footed animals on this thing. And, uh, you know, in this vision, this is what he saw. But through the, the manifestation came a voice and the voice said rise peter kill and eat so this was the voice of the lord this was an encounter with god but peter said not so lord not so lord i remember romel didn't say rise eat kill and eat this is the lord saying to him rise peter kill and eat but peter is saying not so lord for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. 
Now that's that's his response. And a voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times. This means Peter was so baptized and immersed in, in his historical view that the same voice had to come three times to him. Three times to him. And the object was taken back into heaven again. Now, why did the Lord show him this? Why, 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 why would the Lord show him this? Because remember, Peter grew up uh, in, in a, a traditional Jewish home that was basically lived under the, the, the rules and the laws of Judaism. But there's a man that was actively involved in ministry, doing mighty exploits for God in ministry. And God now shows him such a powerful vision. And initially there was a resistance. Now let's be honest, this was an authentic, genuine manifestation. It was an authentic, genuine vision from God. The voice was from God and it was authentic. But you notice the initial resistance. Because God was breaking certain things in the life of Peter. He was, he was dealing with certain things in the life of, of Peter. And these were traditions. But three times the voice came. Three times the voice came. And so when God shows us certain things, we have to respond to it. We have to respond to it. And when we go to Galatians chapter 2, uh, this time genuinely in closing, verse 11, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I would stood him to his face because he was to be blamed. He was to be blamed, which is the Peter, the Peter that had the vision, had the manifestation. He heard the voice of the Lord. Heard the voice of the Lord. And verse 12 says, For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So, uh, let me read the, the whole context and the text and then we, we, we will explain. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. So, even, so, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. There, there, there we go. They were not straightforward. In other words, Peter sat on both sides. Now remember, the diet of the Gentiles was different. The food that they set on their tables was different. Peter, after he had the manifestation, had this vision from God, he would sit and he would eat with them because he realized now that that was not unclean. But whenever the Jewish people will come, he will quickly move away from the table because he has to prove now I'm still holding fast to my traditions. And God has not called us to live that way because this is what we will call hypocrisy. And hypocrisy should not be in us. Amen. We should be straightforward about the truth of the gospel. And so, you know, I just wanted to point out to us that, that sometimes we hold fast to an historical, traditional, cultural view. We, we hold on to those traditions. And sometimes those traditions become an hindrance to us receiving the fullness of God. Amen. We are the sons of God. And because we are his sons, we must love truth. We must love truth. We must embrace truth. There are many things I had to, uh, my, 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 my spirit did not agree with. For example, when you take uh, democracy in the church. But I grew up in that system. 
where, where people were voted into positions. Th those are unbiblical practices. Unbiblical practices. But, but when light came, when light came, change had to be made. Change had to be made. Amen. And, and, and we must be willing sometimes when we hear truth, we must also receive it. And when we receive it, we must implement it. We must become practitioners of truth. Amen. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, God bless you abundantly. Grace, mercy and peace to you and your family. Amen.